Assalamu alaikum everyone, hope you all are doing well. So today in this video we are going to talk about those nematodes whose larvae are responsible for causing the disease. And these include Toxocara, Anisakis, and Chalastoma or Ancelastoma, Angiostrongylus or Angiostrongylus. I've discussed all the nematodes, the intestinal nematodes and the tissue nematodes in my recent videos. Go check them first and then watch this video. Before starting the lecture, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your info is always welcomed in the comments section. Have a cup of tea and let's get started. Nematodes. These are parasitic roundworms. They are also termed as nematelanthes. Because the word nemata means thread, they can also be called as thread-like organisms. Nematodes have separate genders. Uh, one is male and the other one is female. Lecture outline. I've introduced you guys to the nematodes. Now we'll discuss about the classification of parasite. Because uh, nematodes are also parasites, then we'll look into the classification of nematodes and then into the today's topic, the nematodes whose larvae are responsible for causing diseases. Parasite. It is an organism that needs other organisms for its survival. It is further classified into protozoa and helminths. Protozoa, for example, Antamoeba histolytica and helminths, for example, Tinea saginata. Helminths are further classified into platyhelminthes, also termed as flatworms, for example, Diphilobotrium latum, and nematodes, which are also termed as roundworms, for example, Enterobius vermicularis. Platyhelminthes, the flatworms, are further classified into two, the cestode tapeworms, for example, Tinea solium, and trematodes, the flukes, for example, Schistosoma. Nematodes, which are also called as roundworms, are further classified into the intestinal nematodes and the tissue nematodes. I have complete video series on the intestinal nematodes and the tissue nematodes. Browse the channel, you will find them. Intestinal nematodes include Enterobius vermicularis, Trichurus trichiura, Ascaris lambricoides, Ankylostoma and Nicator americanus, Trongyloides turcoralis, Trichinella spiralis. And the tissue nematodes include Wuteraria bancrofti, Oncotherca volvulus, Loa loa dracunculus medinensis. But in today's video, we are going to discuss those nematodes whose larvae are responsible for causing the diseases. The first one in the list is Toxocara. It is a scarred roundworm of the mammals. It is responsible for causing toxocariasis or visceral larva migrants, VLM. It is caused by zoonotic species. Uh, what is zoonosis? Zoonosis is actually the infection that spreads from animals to the human beings. As in this picture, you can visualize the Toxocara canis. Toxocara is further classified into two. The dog roundworm, Toxocara cani, and the cat roundworm, the Toxocara cati. Habitat. The definitive hosts for the Toxocara are the dogs, while the dead end or the accidental hosts are the human beings. If you don't know what is the dead end host, it is actually the host who accidentally gets the infection but is not responsible for further transmitting the infection. The infection just ends in that very host. Transmission. Transmission occurs by ingesting the soil contaminated with larvae of the Toxocara. Life cycle. It has two stages, the dog cycle and the human cycle. Dog cycle. The adult Toxocara canis female in the dog's intestine produces eggs that are passed in the feces into the soil. Here the human cycle starts. Human ingests the soil containing the eggs, which hatch into the larvae in the small intestine. The larvae migrate to many organs, like the liver, brain, eyes. The larvae eventually are encapsulated and die. The life cycle is not completed in humans. Humans are therefore accidental or dead and hosts. Here in this picture, you can visualize it starts here. When the eggs are passed in feces of the dogs or the cats, these eggs then undergo the environmental cycle. Um, 
they were first unembryonated then uh, during uh, development they went under certain developmental stages and become the embryonated egg and this embryonated egg actually contains this L3 larvae that is uh, responsible for causing the infection we are not concerned with these two because um, we are studying uh, the one the cycle that is concerned with the human so when these are ingested by the humans humans will get the infection um, the l3 larvae will migrate to different organs and will cause the infection but um, have you um, noticed that there's no continuation error there between the human and the dog because the humans are the dead end hosts and they're not responsible for further transmitting the infection. Pathogenesis. Pathology is related to the granulomas that form around the dead larvae. As a result of a delayed hypersensitivity response to the larval proteins. Clinical findings. The most serious clinical finding is blindness that is associated with retinal involvement. But we can also find fever, hepatomegaly, and pruritic urticarial rash. Epidemiology Young children are primarily affected because they are likely to ingest soil that contains those eggs of the Toxocara. And Toxocara canis is a common parasite of dogs in the United States. Lab diagnosis, we'll need samples of blood and urine. Then we'll go for microscopy, some blood tests, urine tests. Serologic tests are commonly used but the definitive diagnosis depends on visualizing the larvae in the tissue. The presence of hypergammaglobulinemia and eosinophilia supposed to diagnosis. Treatment. Many patients recover without treatment, but the treatment of choice is either albendazole or mebendazole, but there is no proven effective treatment. Prevention. Dogs should be dewormed and children should be prevented from eating soil. Okay guys, let's review Toxocara before discussing the remaining uh, nematodes. Toxocara is responsible for causing toxocariasis or visceral larva migraines, VLM. Its mode of transmission is via ingestion of the eggs. The definitive hosts are the dogs, while the dead end or the accidental hosts are the human beings. Endemic areas are worldwide, especially US. Primary location is the intestine. Diagnosis is made clinically, but serologic tests are also done. Treatment of choice is albendazole or mebendazole. It is a tissue nematode, it has no insect vector and the stage that infects the humans is the eggs in the dog's feces and the stage in humans most associated with the disease is the larvae in the internal organs. Important stage outside humans is the adult worms in the intestine of the dogs um, which then releases the eggs. So actually the eggs are responsible for transmitting the infection. The next nematode is the ankylostoma or ancylostoma. It has different pronunciations at different places. Um, you can choose the one you like. It is a tissue nematode. It is responsible for causing cutaneous larva migraines, CLM. It is a hookworm. It can't complete its life cycle in humans. In this picture, you can visualize the ancylostoma. Ancylostoma or ankylostoma, I like the pronunciation ankylostoma, but for now I'll say ancylostoma. So it is further classified into two, ancylostoma caninum, the dog hookworm, and the ancylostoma brasilensi, the cat hookworm. Transmission. Transmission occurs through penetration in the skin, the penetration of the larvae. Pathogenesis. The larvae penetrate the skin and migrate through subcutaneous tissue, causing an inflammatory response. The lesions, creeping eruption, are extremely pruritic. Now you might be thinking, what are actually the creeping eruption? So, creeping eruption appears as a winding, snake-like rash with blisters and it itches. It is a lot. 
so that's why I've said that it is extremely pruritic. The larvae are typically confined to the epidermis as they lack the collagenase, which is necessary to break through the basement membrane. Most infections are localized in the lower legs as it is the common site of larval penetration. Um, that's why I've mentioned the lower extremities. The eruption appears to migrate as the larvae move up to a few centimeters daily. Clinical findings, lesions, pruritus, serpiginous rash. Epidemiology. The disease occurs primarily in the southern United States in children and construction workers who are exposed to infected soil. Diagnosis. The diagnosis is made clinically. Um, the laboratory is of little value. Treatment. Albendazole or ivermectin is usually effective. All right, let's review this before uh, starting the next parasite. As it is ankylostoma or ancylostoma, it is responsible for causing cutaneous lava migraines, the CLM. Mode of transmission is by the penetration of uh, skin by larvae. Hosts are the humans. The endemic areas are the worldwide, especially US. Primary location is the epidermis. Diagnosis is mainly clinical. Treatment is done uh, by albendazole or ivermectin. It is a tissue nematode. It has no insect vector, and the stage that infects humans is the filariform larvae that penetrate the skin. Um, and as I've told you, that this organism cannot complete its life cycle in the humans. So the stage uh, in humans most associated with the disease is the larvae in the subcutaneous tissue. And the important stage outside humans is the adult worm in the dog's intestine that releases the eggs which are converted into the larvae. Next up is Anisakis. Its full name is Anisakis simplex. It is responsible for causing anisakiasis. It is caused by the larvae of nematode. There's an Anisakis family's member, Pseudotera noa decipiens. That is responsible for causing non-invasive form of anisakiasis. We're going to discuss that in a moment. Habitat. The definitive hosts are human beings, while the intermediate ones are marine mammals, crustaceans, and marine fish. Transmission occurs by ingesting the raw seafood. Life cycle. The larvae are ingested in raw seafood and can penetrate the submucosa of stomach or intestine. The adult worms live in the intestines of marine mammals such as whales, dolphins and seals. The eggs produced by the adults are eaten by crustaceans which are then eaten by marine fish such as salmon, mackerel and herring which uh, are then eaten by the humans and humans get infected. Clinical findings. The most common ones are abdominal pain, occult blood in stool. Why did I use the word occult? Uh, because it means that we can't see with naked eyes, so blood will be present in the stool, but we will not be able to see it until we visualize it under the microscope. Other findings are gastroenteritis, and an acute infection of this disease resembles appendicitis, like the symptoms of appendicitis uh, will appear. We'll think that it is appendicitis, but actually it will not be. And the chronic infection resembles the gastrointestinal cancer. Epidemiology. Most cases in the United States have been traced to eating sushi or sashimi, especially salmon and red snapper, in Japanese restaurants. Lab diagnosis. We'll need samples of blood and stool. The diagnosis is typically made endoscopically or on a liprotomy, but we'll also go for some blood tests, we'll go for microscopy, and uh, microbiologic and serologic tests are not helpful in the diagnosis. Treatment. There is no effective drug, and surgical removal may be necessary.
prevention. Prevention consists of cooking seafood adequately or freezing it for 24 hours before eating. As I told you earlier that we'll be discussing pseudoteranoa decipients. So it is responsible for causing non-invasive form of anisakiasis and larva of this organism is responsible for causing the disease transmission the larvae are acquired by eating undercooked fish and which are responsible for causing vomiting and abdominal pain um, the diagnosis is made by finding the larvae in the intestinal tract or in the vomitus um, there is no drug treatment the, the larvae can be removed during endoscopy all right let's review it the organism is anisakis. It is responsible for causing anisakiasis. Mode of transmission is why ingestion of larvae in the undercooked food, especially the seafood. Hosts are the human beings and dynamic areas are Japan, US and Netherland. And primary location is the intestine and stomach. Uh, diagnosis is primarily made clinically. Treatment, um, there's no drug available for treating it. It is an intestinal nematode. It has no insect vector and the stage that infects the humans is the larvae in the fish ingested and stage in humans most associated with the disease is larvae in some mucosa of GI tract and the important stage outside humans is the larvae in the fish muscle. The last parasite in our parasitology series is Angiostrongylus cantonensis. It is the larvae of the rat lung nematode, the Angiostrongylus cantonensis. It is responsible for causing eosinophilic meningitis. Okay, first I'll tell you what is meningitis. It is inflammation of the meninges of our brain. There are three meninges, the protective membrane is covering. Sorry for the background noise. My puppy is in a mood to bark a lot today. There are a total of three of them. External one is dura matter, then we've got arachnoid matter, and then the pia matter or mater, whatever you call it. So eosinophilic meningitis means a meningitis that is characterized by many eosinophils in the spinal fluid and in the blood. Usually at least 10% of white blood cells uh, are eosinophil. The larvae are typically ingested in undercooked seafood. So this is how it is transmitted. Um, seafood such as crabs, prawns, and epidemiology. Infection by this organism most often occurs in Asian countries. Clinical findings include vomiting and abdominal pain. Diagnosis is made primarily on clinical grounds, but occasionally the laboratory will find a larva in the spinal fluid treatment. There is no treatment. Most patients recover spontaneously without major sequelae. As I've told you about eosinophilic meningitis, so it is also caused by the larvae of two additional nematodes. The one is Nasostoma spinigerum. It is an intestinal nematode of cats and dogs, and it is acquired by eating undercooked fish and is treated with albendazole, as you can visualize this one in the picture. And the other one, which is responsible for causing eosinophilic meningitis, Bayless Ascaris procyonis. It is a raccoon roundworm and is acquired accidentally uh, by ingesting raccoon feces. Um, these organisms cause more severe disease than angiostrongylus and fatalities occur. Um, as I've told you that for Nethostoma, the treatment is if albendazole, it can be effective, but for Bayless Ascaris, there's no treatment. And that's it. Thank you for being with me. I hope you enjoyed it. If you really did, give this video a big, big thumbs up. Don't forget to connect with me on all of my socials. I've got my Instagram where I've recently uploaded what are the good resources um, like textbooks, YouTube channels, apps, uh, flashcards for Madison subjects. I've got my Twitter and I rarely upload blogs, so do check them out. Till next time, Assalamualaikum.